Welcome everyone to this evening's Zoom program, Zionism Matching Knowledge with Passion, featuring Alex Rivchin. I'm Sharona Whistler, and I serve as the Executive Director for the Zionist Organization of America's Florida Region. I want to give a special welcome to our local and national board members and donors who are with us today, and to all of my colleagues who are on this Zoom. A special thank you to my colleagues who are helping behind the scenes with tonight's call, Alan Jay. Director of Outreach and Engagement, Stuart Pavlak, our Executive Director in Pittsburgh, and ZOA Director of Marketing, Natalie Lazaroff. Also a special thanks to our local and national board member, Liz Browser, who's on with us for introducing ZOA to tonight's guest speaker. I'm so proud and honored to work with such a dedicated ZOA team, not just those who I mentioned, but everyone our crucial work in Israel activism and combating against anti-Semitism, be it on college campuses, on Capitol Hill with our government relations department, and in the courts with our Center for Law and Justice is continuously relied upon, and our incredible ZOA team is tireless. And on a more personal note, I'm proud to represent ZOA because I know we'll always be unapologetic and uncompromising in our Zionism and on behalf of the Jewish people, speaking the truth. So I just wanna say that ZOA's voice and all of your voices, involvement and financial support on behalf of ZOA is needed and very much appreciated. On that end, I must announce that you all have an incredible opportunity to participate in our upcoming virtual superstar gala taking place on December 27th at 7 p.m. The event will feature Ambassador David Friedman, Israel's new ambassador to the US and UN Ilad Erdan, uh, rapper and actor Ice Cube, and actor John Voigt, of course, our national president, Morton Klein, and others. Do not miss this. And please help support, su support ZOA's crucial work by placing an ad in the journal that will be exhibited at the event and shared with our supporters. One of my colleagues will put the info in the chat box when we open it up for Q&A. For our audience, Please keep yourselves muted during the program. We'll have a Q&A from the audience using the chat box feature, which I believe is disabled for now, but we'll open it up for questions as Mr. Rivchin is winding down. So keep an eye out for that and write down your questions so you don't forget them. For if you're like me, then you're constantly building on your foundational knowledge of Zionism historical and biblical Jewish connection to the land of Israel, the modern history of Israel and its reestablishment, current political and international affairs. Tonight's guest, Alex Rivchin, identifies how important it is to know Israel's history and facts to match the passion we have for the Jewish state. Alex was born in the Ukraine in Kiev. His family left the Soviet Union as refugees and refusants. In 1987, when Alex was three years old, settling in Sydney, Australia, he began his career in civil service and then practiced law at two of the world's largest firms. While serving as a spokesman for the Zionist Federation UK, Alex was awarded a prestigious Israel Research Fellowship at a Jerusalem-based think tank. Currently, he is the co-CEO of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry and the author of two internationally acclaimed books of history and politics, the anti-Israel agenda, inside the political war on the Jewish state, and Zionism, the concise history. Alex, thank you for spending this time with us. It is truly an honor to have you with us this evening or for you, daytime for you. And the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharona, for that lovely introduction. It's really a delight to spend this evening with you. I only wish we could be together in person, and I sincerely hope that in the new year, international travel will resume, and I'll have the opportunity to meet many of you on my next speaking tour of the US. So I'd like to firstly thank Sharona for inviting me to speak, also to Alan Jay and Liz Hauser for getting in touch with me. And I want to thank all of the members, the donors, the professional staff and board members of this distinguished and noble organization, led so admirably by the great Mort Klein. My latest book, which I'll be speaking about tonight, goes into the role of Justice Brandeis and Rabbi Silva, two former presidents of the ZOA, and towering figures in American Zionism. 
and no history of Zionism would be complete without paying recognition to their contribution to the rebirth of our national home. So this evening I'll be talking about the concepts central to understanding Zionism and the justness, the necessity and the wonder of our emancipation movement. And after that, I'll take any and all questions that you have. So when I produced my first book in 2017 titled The Anti-Israel Agenda Inside the Political War on the Jewish State, I was determined to inspire new advocates and activists. I wanted to equip the reading public with the facts and knowledge they need to understand what this conflict is really all about. But more than that, I was compelled by my upbringing as a Soviet Jew with an acute awareness of the daily cruelties and injustices to which my people were subject and to now use my position as a citizen of a free country to stand up and to hit back. My new book is very much a continuation of that mission, but it also came in response to a very specific problem. It had become apparent to me, as no doubt it is to all of you, that the word Zionist has been stripped of its true meaning and has instead become a word of infamy and curse. Somehow the movement that sought to liberate or at least shelter the Jewish people from anti-Semitism, which has seen us hounded and humiliated and burned in every generation, the movement that sought nothing more than a scrap of land for the Jews to call their own so that we and our contributions to humanity should not vanish from this earth, somehow this has become akin to racism, to Nazism, to colonialism, to white supremacism, imperialism, and every other popular conception of evil known today. These are lies that cannot be allowed to be laundered into truth because the consequence of allowing this deliberate distortion of Zionism to take place is that new generations will only ever know of Zionism and Zionists as an evil to be fought. And when Zionism is the national movement of the Jewish people, when it is the foundational movement of the Jewish state, this will be a fight that will ensnare Jews of the left and of the right, religious and secular in Israel and the diaspora without distinction like every assault on the Jewish people before it. So this is why I felt that a book explaining Zionism, its defining events, its key figures, and its present challenges, both internal and external, was so badly needed. And in seeking to write this book, I initially planned to present it as a direct rebuttal of the most pervasive and damaging accusations leveled against Zionism today. For example, that Zionism is a form of racism, a lie declared to be truth by the UN General Assembly on the 10th of November, 1975, or that the Zionists were actually in league with the Nazis, an outrageous claim popularized by the former mayor of London, Ken Livingston, a couple of years ago, to the extent that Hitler plus Zionists became a top Google search in the UK for a time. Or the claim made by one of the founders of the Women's March with the deliberate aim of purging Jews from progressive movements, that Zionism is incompatible with feminism. And while my book addresses all of this, it seemed to me that the best way to demystify Zionism, the best way to reclaim Zionism, and the best way to debunk the slander deliberately and strategically leveled against it was not to act as the public defender of Zionism against its accusers, but to simply tell the story of Zionism in a manner that was sincere, honest, and clear, aimed at an audience of those willing to listen. And I'm confident that everyone that reads my book will come away with a better understanding of what Zionism is, what it isn't, why it's inextricably linked to every phase of Jewish history and therefore forms a fundamental part of Jewish identity. So how do we correctly understand Zionism? We can define it simply as the support for belief in the right of the Jewish people to exercise national self-determination in some part of their ancestral lands. And it emerged in the late 19th century with the aim of ingathering some of the Jews who've been scattered throughout the world into a single national polity through which they could freely determine their own political status and safeguard and enlarge those things that make the Jewish people distinct, their languages, their culture, their history, their traditions, their heritage, and their religion. But if we really want to understand Zionism, we have to understand the concepts that are at its core. And the first such concept is the idea of Jewish peoplehood. And by this, I, of course, mean that the Jews, aside from being linked by our monotheistic faith and the texts and traditions that come from it, also form a distinct ethnic and national group. We are a people, and we attained this condition of peoplehood by virtue of originating in a single place, a place where we developed the Hebrew language, a place where we developed our poetry and our writing, where we developed national traditions based on glorious battles and deep tragedies, and a place 
what we developed our greatest gift to humanity, the ethics derived from the Jewish religion. And so the second concept that is absolutely central to understanding Zionism is connection to land. Now, this is not something unique to the Jewish people. Ethnic minorities and peoples all around the world feel deep spiritual and emotional ties to the lands in which they became a people, the lands to which they are indigenous. And for the Jewish people, that land has always been what we have known as Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, what later became Palestine, and what is again now known as Israel. And the Jews always demonstrated the strength of this connection to land through the ferocity with which we defended it and tried to stave off those that tried to keep us from our land, Syria, Babylon, Rome, and Greece. And those who have attempted to thwart Zionism and to eradicate any autonomous Jewish presence from the Middle East have also understood the importance of this connection, which is precisely why they've sought to deny it. We have seen in contemporary times, Palestinian-led campaigns in UN agencies aimed at denying the Jewish connection to Hebron and to Jerusalem, to our holy sites like the Western Wall and the Cave of the Patriarchs. We've seen leading Palestinian officials claim that the existence of two Jewish temples in Jerusalem was a myth. And this happened in ancient times as well. When the Emperor Hadrian put down the final Jewish rebellion in the year 135 CE, he not only slaughtered hundreds of thousands, scattering many more throughout the vast lands of the Roman Empire, hoping they would forget their native lands. He prohibited entry of Jews into Jerusalem on pain of death. He renamed Jerusalem Alia Capitolina. He erected a pagan temple on the ruins of our Jewish temple. And he renamed Judea Syria Palestina, believing that by scattering the people, by destroying our holy sites, by even renaming our land, he could break the bonds of peoplehood and nationhood, and the Jews would simply vanish among the peoples where they had come to live. But the Jews would never forget Zion. Now no longer something to be possessed and touched, it came instead to animate our dreams and visions and inhabit our entire worldly consciousness. So if we understand that the Jews are a people, a nation with national rights, with a deep and profound connection to our ancestral lands, we begin to understand Zionism as an organic expression of this. There's so much to talk about in the story of Zionism, but this evening I want to focus on three aspects. Firstly, the justness of Zionism, secondly, its necessity, and thirdly, its capacity to inspire. So firstly, to the justness of Zionism. When the first Zionist Congress was held in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, it resulted in a manifesto, a brief document drafted by Zionist leaders from around the world, which expressed in concise terms exactly what the Zionist movement stood for and what it sought to achieve. And that was to establish a national home for the Jewish people in the land of Israel secured under public law. It would not be through war, it would not be through the displacement of others, it would be through the law. And for a people who had lived for nearly 2000 years subject to the whims and fancies of those who ruled over us, whose inferior status had often been enshrined in law, only by securing international legal recognition of our national and human rights could we hope to achieve our equality. Then the first major recognition of the legitimacy of Zionism, of course, came in the form of the Balfour Declaration on the 2nd of November 1917, issued by the British government, though this was in fact preceded by an early statement of support by the French foreign minister in June of that year. And then we see a subsequent statement of support by Woodrow Wilson in 1918. And the Balfour Declaration came at a time when the British and their allies were liberating the colonies of the Ottoman Empire, including Palestine, and it pledged British support for the creation of a Jewish national home in the land that Hadrian had renamed Palestine. And it would later become a point of debate as to whether the Balfour Declaration was itself a legal promise, but this would really pass into the realm of academic interest only, as in subsequent years, the precise wording and terms of the Balfour Declaration was incorporated into a series of treaties and international agreements, which without a doubt had binding legal effect. So first you have the covenant of the League of Nations, which establishes the mandatory system under which the great powers, the victorious allies of World War I would act as custodians or mandatories of the newly liberated lands of the Ottoman Empire. And this was one of the requirements of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, which demanded the decolonization and autonomous development of these lands. Then at San Remo in April, 1920, Britain is appointed the mandatory or custodian of Palestine 
with the express obligation of facilitating Jewish migration to the land and bringing about a Jewish national homeland. You then have the treaties of Sevra and Lucerne with the vanquished Turks, which again incorporates the precise wording of the Balfour Declaration. And when the League of Nations, which is the forerunner to the UN, formally adopted the League of Nations mandate for Palestine in 1922, this had the effect in the words of Heim Weizmann of converting the earlier promises from a policy position to an international legal obligation recognized by the international community as a whole. When Israel declared its independence on the 14th of May, 1948, this was the last step in a long and comprehensive legal process, which as Alan Dershowitz writes in the introduction to my book, gives Israel the most legitimate birth certificate of any modern democracy. As Winston Churchill said, it is manifestly right and fair that the Jews scattered throughout the world should have a national home and a center where some of them may be reunited. And where else can that be but in the land with which for more than 3,000 years they've been intimately and profoundly associated. The necessity of Zionism has been proven and continues to be proven before our eyes. In fact, it's difficult to think of another political concept that has been proven as definitively as the idea that the Jews require a national home to secure their survival. Long before the Nazi period, the Roman Empire, the church, nationalist figures like Bogdan Khmelnytsky, cultural titans like Martin Luther, had all imprinted on the collective psyche a characterization of the Jew that made the Holocaust possible, even inevitable. Luther had called the Jews thirsty bloodhounds and murderers of all Christendom. They poisoned water and wells, stole, stole children, and tore and hacked them apart. In 1895, decades before the world had even heard of Hitler, the Speaker of the German Parliament called the Jews cholera germs. And what is to be done with such a thing but to destroy it? As the historian Yehuda Bauer said, one does not argue with parasites. Israel was not created because of the Holocaust. Israel is not a burden dropped on the heads of the Arabs to atone for European guilt. As we have seen, the legitimacy of Zionism had been established long before the war period. But the Holocaust, which saw the army of a sophisticated nation traverse the European continent with the mission of extinguishing every last Jewish life, aided by collaborationist regimes and police forces and politicians and police forces in every place it entered, did have a profound impact on the course of Zionism. It served to prove without question that a national home for the Jewish people was not only a legal right, it was an existential necessity. And one need only ask the Uyghurs, the Yazidi, the Tibetans, the Kurds, the Assyrians, the persecuted and abandoned peoples of the world today, what it means to be stateless in an international system dominated by self-interest, sloth and parsimony. Finally, to the wonder of Zionism. The story of Zionism is the story of an ancient people who by all rational reckoning should have ceased to exist as a distinct people centuries ago and yet somehow through two millennia of exile and inquisitions and pogroms and infernos this people survived retained their culture and distinct sense of peoplehood formed a national movement that was compelling and coherent and achieved the physical return of its people from all over the world to the lands from which they've been exiled two thousand years before this is a story without precedent and without successor and when you delve deeper into the story of Zionism, its defining events, its key leaders, you see all the more how incredible the story is. You take, for example, the Dreyfus Affair. You have a French army officer arrested, tried, wrongly convicted, and imprisoned on a distant island prison for passing military secrets to the Germans. And this happens not because he's guilty, but because as the chief investigator tells the French foreign minister, his Jewish race has made him suspect for a long time. And all the while, the real traitor, a petty swindler and gambler by the name of Ferdinand Estahazi, goes free. Now, this story of miscarriage of justice, of race and inequality, captivated France. But how could the plight of one wretched army officer impact on the fate of the Jewish people? Because observing the public degradation of Dreyfus and the mob of Frenchmen outside the courtroom chanting death to Dreyfus and death to the Jews, is the 34-year-old Paris correspondent of a Viennese newspaper who'd been sent to report on the trial. And he'd been contemplating for a long time how to alleviate the suffering of the Jewish people. 
And in the Dreyfus trial, he witnesses a matinee performance of the very ideas and theories he'd been tinkering with, which served to dislodge his previous view that by being good loyal citizens, something which Dreyfus exemplified, the Jews of Europe would be saved. And that man was, of course, the founding father of modern Zionism, Theodor Herzl. And within six months of the Dreyfus trial, he would pen the first draft of the seminal text of Zionism, the Jewish state. And within a few years, he would convene the first Zionist Congress in Basel, an event so significant that Herzl would later reflect, at Basel, I founded the Jewish state. Another great Jewish writer, Israel Zangville, also reflected on that momentous gathering and wrote, by the river Babylon, we sat down and there we wept, for we remembered Zion. And by the river Basel, we sat down and we resolved to weep no more. And then you have the British Navy in urgent need of the chemical compound acetone to mix with gunpowder to reduce the smoke given off by the heavy guns so as not to reveal their positions to the Germans in the naval battles in World War I. And I hear you all wondering, what the hell does that have to do with the Jewish people in the state of Israel? Because the man who discovered the formula for the mass production of acetone, all while experimenting into something completely different, was a Russian Jew, a lecturer in organic chemistry at the University of Manchester. He had attended the Second Zionist Congress, was mesmerized by Herzl and became devoted to the Zionist cause. That man would become the first president of the state of Israel, Chaim Weizmann. And through his work in acetone, Weizmann came into contact with Winston Churchill, who was then first Lord of the Admiralty. And he would meet David Lloyd George, who was Minister for Munitions and would become the Prime Minister. And he would meet a chap by the name of Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, who would later say of his conversations with Weizmann about Zionism in this period, it is a great cause and I understand it. David Lloyd George in his memoirs would write that his conversations with Weizmann about Zionism during the acetone period were the fount and origin of the Balfour Declaration. And then you have the Ottoman authorities in Palestine expelling 18,000 Jews in 1914. And this would somehow materially aid the cause of Zionism. Why? Because 14,000 of those 18,000 Jews would end up in the Egyptian port city of Alexandria, where by chance the British and their allies would soon arrive by convoy by the Suez Canal bound for the battlefields of Turkey. And there two of the exiled Jews, Zev Jabotinsky and Joseph Trumpledor would impress, it, impress upon the British the benefits of forming the first regular Jewish fighting force since the rebellion against Hadrian in 135 CE. And that outfit known as the Zion Mule Corps would see action at Gallipoli and some of the other bloody battles of that campaign. And they were placed under the command of a British officer by the name of John Henry Patterson, who through his contact with these vigorous and patriotic Jewish men would become a lifelong devotee to the Zionist cause. The great Israeli historian Ben Sion Netanyahu, who in time would father Israel's longest serving prime minister, would name his first son, Yoni, in honor of his friend and the commander of the Zion Mule Corps, John or Yoni Henry Patterson. And Yoni Netanyahu would of course go on to attain his own legendary status, falling in the heroic commander raid on Entebbe in 1976. The story of Zionism is not merely the story of the creation of the state of Israel. It is the story of a people's survival through a sheer will to endure and to remain. It is the story of incredible leaders possessed with a rare vision that turned a shapeless yearning to go home into a precise political program capable of being implemented within the norms and systems of the day. And it's a story colored as much by its villains as by its heroes. Death certificates on white papers Grand Muftis and Nazi executioners played as much a part in the story of Zionism as did Herzl, Weizmann and Ben-Gurion. And it's a story that continues to be written with no end in sight. As Israelis debate, as Lincoln did for America at Gettysburg, what their national project truly means. And the enemies of Zionism steal themselves for a war they have yet to conceive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. The chat box is now open for people to post their questions. While that's being populated, I'm going to um, to, to ask that uh, my colleague post the, the link for the information for our gala that I mentioned earlier, and also announce an upcoming event that we have next week, Lunch with ZOA and Knesset member Naftali Bennett. December 2nd at 12 p.m. 
Eastern time, Israel's right to Judea and Samaria and the dangers of a Palestinian state, featuring Naftali Bennett, chairman of Habayit, a Yehudi and minister of economy, moderated by ZOA chairman Mark Levinson and introductions from ZOA national president Mort Klein. And while we wait for some questions, I'll start by with the question in reference to the misconception that you that you shared um, about the modern the establishment of the modern state of Israel as a, a result of the Holocaust, and I say it's really in spite of the Holocaust, and it's so often asserted um, that fallacy, which I believe is actually dangerous. But can you speak to really the um, the, the danger of that misconception? Yeah, um, it, it is one of the most damaging and consistent and malicious slanders leveled against Israel. And we heard it beautifully put by your Congresswoman Rashida Tayyib when she spoke absolute drivel about how it warms her heart that it was her ancestors that sheltered the Jews after the Holocaust and so forth. And there's a very strategic reason behind advancing that lie because it positions firstly, the Jews as being solely European and it positions the Palestinians as being the organic indigenous people of the land who graciously welcomed in the Jews only to have their homes stolen. That's how the narrative goes. But when you look at the actual history of, of what transpired, it couldn't be more different. Firstly, you have the ancient Jewish roots in the land for one. You have Arab migration to Palestine largely as a result of Jewish migration and enterprise. You have a situation where at every turn, the Arab Palestinian leadership sought to block Jews from coming back to their land. And we have the culmination of that in the white paper of 1939, which effectively blocked more Jewish migration at a time when Europe was poised to destroy the Jewish community. So as a result of the actions of people like Haji Min al Husseini and many other Arab leaders, Jews were killed so far from the narrative that's asserted about them being offered refuge, it's a complete nonsense. The opposite is true. And it's one of those things that has to be counted because as you pointed out, Sharona, it's not done you know, for no reason. It's done with a strategic intent in mind. And that is to undermine the legitimacy of the state of Israel, to depict it as unnatural and, and colonial, and to depict the Palestinians as being the rightful owners of the land. All of those things are untrue. Right. Absolutely. I'm going to uh, announce again to put your chat. I think the chat was disabled, um, but it's now open. Um, in sometimes, sometimes on on the Zooms, we will open people's mic. But instead of that, we're asking for you to type in your question. So um, we have a question asking, how does your legal training mesh with your writing? Uh, look, I guess legal training makes you write in a certain way that is precise and evidence-based rather than more emotional. Uh, and I think that's very important. And it helps me develop arguments and build a case. And the case for Israel is so sound so profound and so varied. You can make the argument for Israel in a whole number of ways, um, from a religious point of view, to a historical point of view, to a political point of view. And the legal training helps me mount those arguments, certainly. Um, but I think that, you know, more than that, it made me determined to seek truth and, and researching and studying the story, the story of Zionism and then writing this book was an exposition of truth. And that certainly came from not only my heritage as a Soviet Jew and my desire to stand up and defend my people, but also from that legal training as well. Do you, to what extent Christian Zionism had on the, the, Engl the Engl England support for the Balfour Declaration? Do you know? Christian Zionism was, was important, but only to an extent. So men like Balfour and Churchill were committed to Zionism because of their Christian faith, more Balfour than Churchill. Churchill was more ambivalent in, in his Christianity. Uh, he was very favorable towards the Jews for other reasons. 
but certainly a lot of the upper classes of the British had this romantic association, attachment, this belief in a Jewish return to their ancestral lands. Um, and that made them emotionally committed to it. There was a very important book that was written by a novelist at the time, George Eliot, called Daniel Deronda, which, you know, you kind of question the extent to which a novel can impact history. But that book was read by everyone in the upper echelons of British society. And it again romanticized this idea of a Jewish national return. So it really gained favor. But ultimately, British foreign policy is not going to be made because of some emotional connection to an idea about Jews return to their homeland. It's going to be based in rail politic, it's going to be based in law and sound policy making and the national interest. And ultimately, there was a belief that the Jews had every entitlement to that land, that when you had post World War One reconstruction, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and the granting of Arab states in the region, it made eminent sense for the Jews as the native sons of their land to be able to return to it and reconstitute their national home. So Christian Zionism was important and it remains very, very important, um, but it was only one part of the base of support for Zionism. Uh, when you look at it in the United States, particularly after the bloody Kishinev pogrom, um, Christian Zionism really coalesced at that point as being not merely something religious and spiritual, but also seeing support for Zionism as an urgent humanitarian mission. And that again helped build support and influence people like Woodrow Wilson, who was also a man of faith. So Christian Zionism and the Christians have been key allies all the way through the Zionist movement. Um, and we're deeply grateful for their support. It's very important going forward as well. How did the United Nations claim that Zionism was is racism in, in 1975? And can you discuss what the what the explanation is, how, how it's legally false, how that could be legally false? So in the last chapter of my book, which is titled Anti-Zionism, I spent a lot of time dealing with this particular issue because it talks, when you unpack the Zionism is racism resolution, you have firstly the way that a complete lie can be laundered into truth. You have a brilliant example of how noble institutions like the United Nations can be corrupted and corroded. Um, and you also see the dark hand of the Soviet Union in changing public opinion and international opinion against Israel. And the backstory to the Zionism is, is racism resolution is a fascinating one because it began with plans for a resolution to be adopted, which uh, condemned all forms of Nazism, racism, and including anti-Semitism. Now the Soviet delegation to the UN thought that that reference to anti-Semitism was a direct rebuke to its own anti-Jewish policies at the time. This is a time of the doctor's plot and the night of murdered poets and a time of real state-sponsored anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. So in order to get that clause deleted from the resolution, the Soviets put up Zionism as being included as the form of racism to be eliminated. And the Soviet delegate at the time privately said that they knew it was a complete nonsense. They thought it had no chance of actually making it into the document. And in the end, it didn't, because what happened was anti-Semitism anti was dropped and Zionism was dropped. So they traded the two off. But that seed had been planted, this idea that Zionism, the emancipation movement of the Jewish people, the movement to give Jews equal rights and national rights and to liberate us from racism was in itself racist. That perverse Orwellian notion had been planted into the minds of international actors. And then you see it reemerge in 1975 and in the years preceding it. So it's a brilliant lesson about the need for vigilance, the need for engagement in international forums, and the need to unpack lies and not accept what organizations like the UN tell us. So as a follow-up to that, can you distill the defense of Zionism as not racist, racism in a simple, straightforward answer that, that those of us who are advocating for Israel can, can easily share and have it well, be think, understandable. I, I think, again, going back to my legal training, you've got to look at the definitions of the terms. So Zionism is the national liberation, the emancipation movement of the Jewish people. And racism is the treatment of certain groups uh, in a discriminatory or inferior way because of their race. So when you marry up those two things and see whether one could be equivalent to the other, there is no conceivable way in which Zionism, which was about liberating Jews from racism, 
could be equated to racism, the very thing from which Zionism sought to liberate the Jews. It's a complete nonsense. And if you explain to any person with an open mind what Zionism is and what racism is, they immediately will see that the two can't be equated with one another. Uh, we have a question about the, the, the UN security resolution that was passed at the end of the Obama administration. I think that's what the, the reference is, um, 2442, that um, disassociated the Jewish, Jewish people to all of our holy sites in the land of Israel, um, which is so obviously nonsensical. Uh, yeah. But like you know, like you just shared with the with the the racism argument, how's a can you share a straightforward way to explain? So that resolution two three three four passed right at the end of the Obama presidency was a colossal stab in the back, really. Uh, and as you've spoken about, Sharon, it basically said that any Jewish presence beyond the defunct 1949 armistice line known as the Green Line is illegal, which would mean that a Jew having a presence at the Western Wall or in the heartland of Jerusalem was illegal by nature. Now, in terms of understanding and explaining why that was such an egregious thing for the Obama administration to do and why it was so damaging, it's not as simple as Zionism is racism, which is just nonsensical on the, on the face of it. And particularly when you've had the United Nations and you've had uh, US administrations and certainly European governments speaking about the land east of the Green Line, what we call Judea and Samaria, what's popularly become known as the West Bank, referring to it as occupied Palestinian territory. Then it follows from that, if it's occupied Palestinian territory, then naturally Israel should have no presence there. But you need to then challenge the underpinnings of that argument, the fact that it's not occupied Palestinian territory. Um, there has never been a Palestinian sovereign state from which the land could have been occupied. Um, and if you go back to the law that I mentioned, that chain of international law, it never distinguished between a Jewish presence east of the Green Line and west. The Green Line hadn't been conceived. And the Jews had a right to settle in all parts of Palestine, of what was historic Palestine. So any notion that a Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria, the Jewish heartland, in places like Hebron, would be illegal is not only historically inaccurate, but it goes against the bodies of international law, which established the right of the Jews to settle there and to a state there. We actually, ZOA actually has material um, on the occupation, the myth of, of occupation, which dates a lot of, you know, has a lot of references to legal and historical facts. And I know that when we do advocacy training, with students, but it's really applicable to, to anybody who, who wants to speak on behalf of Israel and be their own advocate among their friends and their circles of people to, um, it, it's, it's difficult to, to memorize all of these important dates and all of these important um, legal documents and votes. So for, you know, for, for those of us who, want to be able to make Israel's case without needing to remember all of all of these details, what are the most important points that should be made? I think that the, the first thing is to understand that the Jews are the original people of the land, to understand that Zionism is a movement of national return. Uh, any story about Israel, about Zionism, about the Jewish people has to begin with our origins as a civilization and a people in the land with the capital in Jerusalem 3,000 years ago. And even knowing that, which I think every Jew does by virtue of our, of our religion and our holidays, you immediately debunk the notion of imperialism or colonialism playing a part in the creation of Israel. Uh, the idea that Israel could be a colonial construct when its people organically moved back to the lands from which they'd been exiled, with which they had profound ties for four millennia, is an impossibility. Um, I, I'm not a person, I don't believe in kind of talking points. I, I believe in the sort of materials and resources that the ZOA is so good at putting out and, and real knowledge. Um, but I also note, as you point out, Sharona, the need to have something kind of concise that people can digest and learn and use. 
because there's so much out there. And that's why I wrote this book. You know, um, we were discussing offline beforehand that a book about Zionism could run into chapters and chapters and chapters and editions and editions and editions. But my mission here was to produce a brief, concise history, which told the story from the beginning until the end, until the present day, um, and placed it within the context of Jewish history and world history, and explained the legal foundations, the moral, the historical foundations, anti-Zionism and the poison that that movement is, all of these things. So I would encourage people to read the book. I, I think it will give them a great deal of equipment and knowledge um, and strength in then advocating for Israel and the Jewish people. I just put the, the title of the book for, for everyone's reference in the chat. It's Zionism, the Concise History. And then it looks like we have a link, a link to the, to the Amazon page. Um, are there any, and, and if you, if, and Liz Browser is holding it up. Thank you, Liz. Looks like. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm just looking at this, this question. Okay, so the question is, Churchill, you mentioned in your presentation, contravening the League of Nations gave more than half the Jewish homeland to Transjordan. Why is this fact swept under the rug? So it's a very good point, and I talk about it in the book. So in 1922, there was what was known as the Transjordan Memorandum, which effectively cut Palestine in half and created an Arab Palestinian state on the east bank of the River Jordan called Transjordan and later the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. In terms of Churchill contravening international law in doing so, actually the League of Nations Covenant gave, there was a clause in there, which I talk about as well in the book, which gave Churchill, the British government, a right to do that. So it was actually consistent with, with those obligations and promises and the law. Um, but I think that the stronger point in, about the Transjordan Memorandum, and this caused a great schism in the Zionist movement because people like Jabotinsky viewed the Jordan River not being the eastern frontier of Israel, but being the spine, and they wanted a Jewish state on both sides of the Jordan River. Whereas people like Weizmann and Ben-Gurion were more prepared to accept the small Jewish state on one side of the Jordan River only. So it's significant in causing that break in, uh, in Zionism, which arguably continues to this day. But I think the greatest significance of it, and we can debate whether Churchill was right to do it or not. I think Churchill did it because he believed that that would satisfy Arab claims to Palestine, allowing for the creation of a Jewish state, a holy Jewish state in the remainder of Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. But I think the key point is that when we talk now about a two-state solution and the partition of Israel to create a new Palestinian state, that has already been done in 1922-23 with the creation of Jordan. So realistically, there is no international law requirement to partition Israel again and to grant another Arab-Palestinian state. I think that's the central point. We have a question from one of our national board members you know from Liz Browser, how did religious Zionism affect the development of Israel? Well, religious Zionism was, was very important, both in terms of Jewish religious Zionism and Christian. Um, and when you look at the early meetings of, of the Zionist Congress, there were divisions within Zionism about to what extent religion should play a part in the, in the trajectory of the Zionist movement. So people like Herzl and Nordau were staunchly secular in their outlook. Weizmann as well believed in more of a cultural Zionism, whereas others believe that you can't separate the Jewish religion from Zionism because ultimately Zionism is grounded in a belief that this is the land of the Jews, which is a religious belief, also a sociological and a historical one. But I think that the, those two streams of thought have been reconciled, particularly through Rav Cook, and belief now that Zionism, religious Zionism sits comfortably within broader Zionism. And it goes back to my earlier point about there being many ways in which one could argue for the legitimacy and justice and necessity of a Jewish state. And whether you view it as something of religious revelation um, or whether you view it as something that, you know, to cure the world of anti-Semitism and to shelter the Jewish people, you can arrive at the same conclusion of the justice and necessity of Israel in a number of ways. 
and I believe that reconciliation has occurred. Okay, this is an interesting question. Is it true that much of the problems in the period between World War I and World War II was due to the anti-Semitism of the British office, officers who were stationed in Palestine at the time? When you look at the British administration of the mandate in the 20s and 30s, you see a kind of range of attitudes. Um, and certainly there was probably a dose of that old British anti-Semitism in the way that they treated the Jews. I think partly it was, it was less that and more a colonizer's mentality. So the British were still there as a great imperial power um, overseeing this land, which international law obligated them to do so for the purpose of creating a Jewish homeland there. But when you have this dynamic of British soldiers on behalf of the British Empire and this backwater of Palestine, which it was then, you naturally create this dynamic, this power imbalance where the British officers and soldiers view the Jews there, not being as the native people of the land with rights, but as being something inferior. And there were tensions and there were brutalities um, and there were acts of indifference as well, particularly when there were Arab riots aimed at Jews, the Nebi, Nebi Musa riots, what happened in Hebron in 1929. There were some instances of British soldiers intervening and many others of them kind of standing aside. And that's something that we see throughout Jewish history. When you look again, I referred to the Kishinev pogrom, the soldiers there standing aside and allowing the Jews to be massacred. And I think the lesson to be drawn from that is about Jewish self-reliance and strength. We can never leave it again to UN peacekeepers or the goodwill of others to ensure Jewish survival and Jewish security. That is that is such a strong point um, to, to end on. I don't I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you so much again, Alex. This was fantastic, and you didn't you didn't even know that we had some of our Zionist heroes in the audience today. Some of who you mentioned. Delighted to see them. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so before we end the program, thank you so much again. I want to reiterate that we at ZOA are a dedicated group. And if you're on this Zoom, then I know that you want to help ensure that we are stronger than our enemies. So thank you to our current ZOA donors. Your fi financial contributions help make this possible. But we have further to go and we have more that must be achieved. So please support us financially as much as you can. And I will ask my colleague to, to put the donate slash ad placement link for our upcoming ZOA Virtual Superstar Gala in the chat box again. And thanks to your support, ZOA, ZOA will have more of an impact in expanding our crucial work and reaching more people. Please give generously. And as, as always, to learn more, visit our website, zoa.org. And you're always welcome to email me, florida at zoa.org. And I thank Alex again, if you have any closing remarks. Well, I just want to echo what you've said in terms of the work of the ZOA. And again, when you look at the history of the Jewish people and how the Jewish state was created, it was through organizations like this and people like you giving up your time, donating money, serving on boards and uniting the Jewish people towards a great cause. So I encourage you all to support the ZOA and I thank you so much for tuning in this evening. Thank you. <laughs>